Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Vanuk, Executive Director of Library Reads. Thank you so much for joining us for the fourth installment of Murder at the Library Book Club, brought to you by Sourcebooks and Baker and Taylor. I'm thrilled to be here with international best-selling author Caroline B. Cooney. Before we begin the discussion tonight, I do have a few housekeeping items to make you all aware of. There will be multiple chances to win prizes throughout the event. All you have to do is participate in one of our trivia polls or ask a question of Caroline and you'll be entered in to win a mystery prize pack and some other fun mystery themed goodies from Sourcebooks. Don't worry, I will let everyone know when there's something to participate in so you'll know. And if you have questions for Caroline while we're chatting, please put those in the Q&A section as opposed to the chat section where they might get lost. Feel free to use that chat section to say hi, talk to each other participant wise, but leave that Q&A for specific questions so we make sure we find those. So let's go ahead and begin with a little background on Caroline. She is the best-selling author of teen suspense, mystery, and romance novels that have sold over 15 million copies worldwide, including one you might remember, The Face on the Milk Carton, which has sold over 3 million copies and was made into a made-for-TV movie. Caroline has won many state library awards for her writing, and her books have been featured on many library lists, including the New York Public Library's annual Teen Picks. She was born in New York, grew up in Connecticut, and now lives in South Carolina, where it is warm and sunny. Hi, Caroline. It's great to see you this evening. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Hello, everybody. So we are, of course, talking about your brand new book, um, Before She Was Helen. So let's, let's jump right into this and tell me, what was the inspiration for this book? I did write many years ago that young adult book called The Face on the Milk Curtain. And in that story, a young girl recognizes herself on a missing child poster. And she suddenly realizes she's not who th she thought she was. She's living under some other name. She has to make terrifying decisions about what to do next. But she's a kid and she does what kids do. She just blunders around. And after I finished that book, I kept thinking, but suppose you're older when something goes radically wrong for you. Suppose you're 20 or 21 and you make the shocking, profound decision to live your life as a completely different person. You give up your family, your background, your history, your friendships, and you take on a different name. What would make you do that? You wouldn't do it for a lark. Did you do something so unforgivable that you have to hide from it? Or is this about what somebody else did so awful that you have only this one grim, lonely way to escape? Or is it a combination of both? I love plots like this. You were trapped by circumstance. You have to make the best and most ethical decisions. And even though you know some of these decisions are wrong and can only have bad outcomes, now I know that you're a good person because I like to write about good people, but you've done some wrong things. Now supposing that you've lived under this hidden identity for half a century. Nobody caught you over 50 years. Nobody even noticed. And you believe that you can relax. All that subterfuge, all the double blinds you built to keep hidden, you can ease off. Well, you're wrong. Now, I have my own problem. For whom do I write this story? My typical YA readers couldn't care less what a 70 something maiden lady might be up to. My readers would figure she's dead already or she might as well be. So if I wrote this story, I had to write for grownups. And that was so exciting. Suddenly to write an adult book, it was just a huge change. It was all but a new career, I, I couldn't wait. And luckily I was living in the perfect setting. I had moved to Sun City, one of a large chain of developments called Over 55 Active Adult Communities. Who knew, right? Well, the first thing you notice when you drive into Sun City is the unnerving similarity of housing. 
It is plain vanilla with the same two car garage facing front, the same street trees planted the same afternoon. There is such anonymity in these houses that for a long time I could only find my own house by pushing the automatic garage door opener as I drove down the street and seeing what door went up. <laughs> I took my two-year-old grandson for a walk one time. We were only three houses away. And he said, Grandma, we're lost. <laughs> and he was right. The next thing you're aware of in Sun City is the remarkable friendliness of people. They've arrived from all over the country with the express plan of hanging out with new friends and doing new things. Golf, kayaks, pottery, mahjong, softball, garage bands, wine tasting, Ohio club, you name it, and you can do it. All you do is walk into the room and you're part of it. Nobody cares about your background. They might ask where you're from, but then they move on to important things like, are you free for pinnacle? And will you drive the ladies lunch carpool? So not only is your house anonymous, so are all your friends. It's unusual for people to talk about what they did when they worked. They might summarize an entire career by saying, oh, yeah, I was in marketing. Listen, are you trying out for the play? So you find yourself with a raft of friends and you know about them and they know about you, only what you choose to say. So from the very first, I realized you could say anything <laughs> just to know. You could delete any part of your life because nobody cares anyway. You can add to your life and there's nobody there to question it. Now, a common description of Sun City by its residents is summer camp with great housing. People are in and out of each other's houses the way in college you're in and out of your dorms. So among other things, you have access to a lot of places. So let's talk crime because this is a mystery book that I'm writing. If you're a bad guy, parking is impossible. There are no dark alleys or unsupervised lots for you to leave a car. Streets are intentionally narrow to prevent street parking. You either have to know somebody so you can leave your car at their place or you already live there. And there are thousands of residents here. At least one of them is bound to have a shady background and it might as well be you. So I decided that your name in Sun City and for the last 50 years is Helen, although that is not in fact your name. You're having the time of your life in Sun City because that's what Sun City is for. Now, you have not actually retired. Amazingly, in an age where classics have pretty much vanished from American school systems, you have found a part-time job in your old career, which is teaching Latin. So you're still commuting and working. Now, why Latin, you might ask? Because when I turned 50, which is a long time ago now, and I said to myself, what have I not done that I still want to do? One of those things was to go back to school and relearn Latin, which I loved in high school. I wanted to read Julius Caesar and Cicero and not be 14. And if we were in real life people and you were in an auditorium, I'd ask for a show of hands because I know that some of you out there loved Latin as much as I do. Now, in Sun City, you are a good neighbor. Like many here, you check routinely on other people who live alone and what if they've had a fall and there's nobody there to help. You probably have the keys to at least one other house. And because the rooms are so similar, you know exactly what, which room is where. And what if you go next door to check on your annoying and plus unpleasant neighbor because Dom is not answering the daily text that you send at his request. And you go into that house to make sure that Dom isn't lying helpless and alone with broken bones, but the house is empty. Dom doesn't drive a car anymore. He doesn't even own one. So maybe he's out in his golf cart. The garage is empty and you do a wrong thing. You prowl around. It isn't like you and you are going to pay a serious price for it. You find something extraordinary and because you are in the cell phone habit and you take photographs of everything, you take a picture of this extraordinary item and you send it on like show and tell to young people, people of a different generation who are going to forward it. And you know what? You're cooked. This is not the same as opening up your old paper photo album to a certain page. You just made this picture public property. 
And because what you photographed turns out to be stolen, somebody somewhere is going to notify the police because that's what happens with stolen objects. But the real horror is you have left your fingerprints in that house and the fingerprints will tell the truth. You were somebody else before you were Helen. Now that's the appearance of the story, but what about the core of the story? You didn't do this as a game and you didn't do it for a week or a year. I could think of a dozen reasons why you might do this, but not a single reason why you would stick it out for 50 years. I finally realized there had to be two reasons to lead this hidden life. Both these reasons are very dark and they're deeply intertwined. And you might have been able to escape from one, but you cannot escape from the other. I'm not going to discuss these dark and tragic reasons for Helen to do this. Her real name is Clemmy, actually, and I always think of her as Clemmy. Um, because these aren't really fully explained till way into the book. And I don't want to spoil the uh, mystery for people who haven't read it yet by telling them the mystery. But your first looming problem with those fingerprints is not yourself, it's your neighbor. Where is he? A day later in the house you yourself checked, a body is found. Can you keep the neighborhood and the police attention on him instead of on you? Can you both be a dithery, forgetful old woman and at the same time be sharp enough to teach fourth year Latin? You've been at this hiding out business for so long, but you really are tired. You make error after error. But can you still save the girl you once were before you were Helen? Or are both you and that girl going to be destroyed? I loved writing before she was Helen. Now, after all those YA years, which I loved, I loved my books, I loved my readers, I loved my school visits, I loved my YA librarians, but what a delight it was to write for and about somebody my own age. I'm having a ton of fun and I am never retiring. I totally yearn for the day when we all get together and I have always in normal um, presentations had um, door prizes. Well, it's very hard to give you a door prize, but Sourcebooks came up with one. We have the coolest, are these clear? Can people see them? Yes, the one is upside down, but we can totally, we, there we go. There, these are the coolest book plates that Sourcebooks made. All you have to do is send your email address and your name into whoever somebody's going to put their email address on the screen. Yes. And I'm going to sign one of these and mail it to you. That's the closest I can come to a door prize. And if you have a book club and you need several of them, just let me know and I'll send them out. And you have to ask me because I have a lot of these and I need to give them to you. <laughs> um, so thank you for coming. This is really a pleasure. Awesome. So if everybody can see right now, Tiffany just put her email in the chat box. If you don't have that open, you can go ahead and open that and she's got it right there. Um, and she also will be, oh, you don't need to put your own email in right now. You need to send Tiffany an email. And um, she will put that in again later in the chat as well, because when we do the trivia questions, Tiffany is going to be our person who takes care of the winners as well. So if you miss it right now, don't worry about that. We'll put that in again at the end. Um, so let's let's continue talking about Clemmy, Helen, and and the book. Um, I did have to laugh. I actually took Latin in high school. Oh yeah, I did. did you love it? That was a cute conceit. I was sort of waiting to see if she was going to like try to leave some kind of clue in Latin for somebody. Or oh, something. I would love to have done that, but it didn't, didn't fit. <laughs> but I thought, I thought that was really great. I, I don't think it's giving too much away either um, to say that that's kind of how someone tracks her down is because they call all the schools to find out the name of the Latin teacher. And I was like, well, right. You really couldn't do that with a math teacher because big high schools could have like 10 different math teachers but only some of them are going to have a Latin teacher. So that was a, that was a great conceit on that. Um, so speaking more about Clemmy, so tell us a little bit about the character
character of Clemmy. Um, and I, I, I'm just curious, is she someone, is she based on anyone you know, or is there any of yourself in Clemmy? I kind of felt, I definitely, you know, I could read in the author's note that that's, that you live in Sun City. So I was like, well, that's why we have all of this really great detail of what the neighborhood looks like. And I totally got a sense for how it's all cookie cutter every you know they're all the same you can easily get lost and so I'm like well this is great she obviously is telling us about a real place so is Clemmy based on any kind of real person or on yourself tell us a little bit more about Clemmy it's actually crippling to base a, a fictional character on a real person sure. you, you have to make everybody up entirely for example I have a friend around the corner named Donna Donna wants me to name a character for her. <laughs> Donna's a very cheerful, warm, friendly person. But what if in my book, I need that character to be sly and conniving? Mm -hmm. I'm sort of trapped by the real Donna. So my rule is never base a character on anybody at all. And of course, there, there is a lot of me in Clemmy. She's my heroine. But, but basically, no, she's Clemmy. Got it. Got it. Um, what was, um, let, have you ever wanted to change your own name and live under an alias? Was this sort of a, did you write this to kind of maybe get out a little bit of your own, you know, daydream perhaps? Well, don't you think it would be fun? And just I would love to. Out there for everything. <laughs> you are thinking of hiding out. Yes. You don't want to pick some little rural mountain community with six people. And you don't want to big, pick some great big city. You want to come here to Sun City and have tons of fun as well as totally hide out. All you need is gray hair, so you and you'll blend in. I like the sound of that. I like the sound <laughs> of that. That has always been um, one of the kind of reading tropes that I love is the sort of, what if you could just disappear and start your life all over again? What would you leave behind and what would you do? So that was great fun to read how Clemmy did that. Although it's it's out of tragedy. That's sort of the the hard thing I'm sure um, for you was to, to to have to dive and again we don't want to give away anything any secrets but right she she's not doing this for fun she's doing yeah. this because of something bad that happened in her past that she needs to get away from so exactly. it's great great fun to read it though at least to kind of see see how she's living her adventures so um i wanted to I've got another question for you. Um, and I see in the chat, I have several people asking variations of this same question. So we will do the, the audience Q&A in the latter half of the program, but I want to get to this part right now since other people want to know this as well. So you have written mostly in the young adult genre. And you have said that you made the switch because you've written over 75 YA novels and yeah, it was fun. <laughs> so tell us, tell us more about making that switch. Was it difficult? Um, other than obvious things like characters and settings and different things that can happen to these characters, how is writing an adult mystery different than writing for a teen audience? I know everybody really wants to know that. Like when, why did you decide this? How did you, how did you come to do this? Um, it was, it was quite difficult to make the change. Okay. In fact, there was another whole book. It was not a mystery. It was a historical novel, which was my first attempt at um, an adult book after I decided to stop writing YA. And it just wasn't successful. I wrote it and rewrote it. But I had to learn all over again how to do the pacing, because it's different in adult books. Um, how deep can you get into things a lot deeper in adult books? Um, Although a lot of YA is harsh and frightening now and sometimes very dystopian. Mm -hmm. Yes. The fact is, I think it's somewhat superficial. Real tragedy is, is terribly painful. And, and, and that's what Clemmy has faced more than once. And so to get deeply into it, it took me a while to learn the rhythm of all that. What did you, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you did it? Was it just through writing and all of a sudden did something kind of switch on for you? Was it practice or? Um, I, I don't mind throwing things away. So I write okay. all day long and then, um, you know, it used to be that you would, let me see if I have a piece of paper here. I need a piece of paper, I've got one. Used to be in my youth, see, I wrote on a typewriter. Okay. And the page would be stupid and useless and you'd go. <laughs> And then you chuck it across the room, see? <laughs> but now you don't do that. It's right. inside your um, computer. So it's not half so fun. Right. But I, I write a ton of versions. I rewrite them all. Okay. I, I say all the dialogue out loud. My children, when they used to come home from school, would always knock and yell, Mom, 
don't talk to yourself, we're home now. Because that's how you see if the dialogue is good. You say it over and over again to get it. But you had to have different dialogue. Grownups don't talk the way teenagers do. And of course, it's important to remember I'm 73 now. I'm pretty removed from teenagers. My children are pretty <laughs> removed from teenagers. That's a very good point. <laughs> So um, what would you say your biggest challenge in writing this particular book was? Actually, this is one of the few books I've written that didn't have challenges. Oh. Once I got launched and I had my plot in my mind, mm -hmm. the book just flew out of me. And I loved Clemmy. I loved her a lot. And, um, I, and so it was a lot of fun to do this. This poor girl, Clemmy deserves an Olympic medal for identity change. Um, and she stuck it out for sad reasons. And, and I think you question throughout the book, should she really have done this? But in the end, you find she didn't have much choice about the whole thing. Um, but it, it wasn't nearly as challenging as many other books. The difficulty, however, was it, it has flashbacks. Yes. And for any author, flashbacks can be very hard to handle. You, you don't want them to smash the reader in the face. You don't want them to double back on themselves. They have to be in a good order. There can't be so many of them that it ruins the pace of the actual story. So that's hard, but I love that stuff. I love writing. So it, it wasn't, you know, every minute of this was a good time. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, I think that we should take a moment here now for some before she was Helen trivia. So let's do our first activity. And so what's gonna happen is we'll have a trivia question that pops up on screen there. I can see it now, so hopefully you can all see it as well. And um, Clemmy meets Dom's nephew Wilson for the first time in the same place that Wilson's body is later found. That place is, everyone go ahead and, and do your vote there. Um, when you, everyone who participates in the poll or who's been asking questions, you'll be entered to win a mystery prize pack from Sourcebooks. So go right ahead on that. And um, while people are voting, I think we'll leave that up for a minute or so until everyone has a chance to do that. But let me let me go on with some more questions since we've got a lot of questions for you. So um, we're going to take a little detour for a second to talk about your next book, actually. So you have a new mystery thriller that comes out with Sourcebooks Poison Pen Press next summer, and that's called The Grandmother Plot. So can you tell us a little bit about that book? I can it's not set in Sun City. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Clemmy. It's a standalone okay. book. It's about a young man named Freddie. And Freddie is a glass blower of a type called lamp working, which is what my son does. So that was my research was going to my son's studio. And lamp workers make beads, urns, um, and pipes, drug paraphernalia, that is to say. So Freddie, Freddie is this fine young man who makes drug paraphernalia. And he is a slacker and suddenly finds himself responsible for his 93-year-old grandmother who is in dementia care. And it's up to Freddie to take care of her. But Freddie is the least reliable person on earth with the sketchiest friends. Helen, that is to say, Clemmy makes a couple of big errors, but Freddie's whole life is an error. That's all he does is make mistakes. And his grandmother, who is really by this time in her dementia only a placeholder for herself, his grandmother is totally and utterly dependent on him. Now, this was based on the fact that my mother was in dementia care for many years. And between us, my daughter and I, uh, managed to visit her or take her out practically every day. And dementia care is just as weird and fascinating a setting as Sun City, but it includes heroism. There, there's a sort of magnificence to the people who work there, to the families who come, and to the courage of the patients who suffer this terrible thing. But Freddie, Freddie is not magnificent. He's a low-life criminal. And he still has got to save his grandmother when he endangers her by his foolishness. The grandmother plot. 
the grandmother plot. Great. All right. So that one is coming out next summer um, from uh, Sourcebooks Poison Pen Press. So everyone, I'm sure, will be excited to see that one come along. So I believe the poll is closed. So um, we should have that. Oh, there we go. Pops up right there. And yes, 55 of you got it correct. Wilson's body is found in the golf cart. So thanks for participating in that poll. We'll have another one in just a few minutes. But first, let's get on to some more questions here. So we have questions that came in ahead of time from some of our participating um, Murder in the Library Book Club libraries. So the first one is from the Keene Public Library and Granville County Libraries. These two, these two libraries asked pretty much the same question, which was, please tell us more about your writing process. How did you come up with so many YA stories in the past? And what's your biggest inspiration for the adult stories writing now? How do you take the ideas you have and get them down onto paper? Do you sort all the details in your head first and then write them down? Or do you get it all out and then sort it from there? So tell us a little bit about the mechanics of writing. Everyone's always interested in that. They are. Well, I, I learned how to write YA really um, when I wrote, uh, paperback romances, um, uh, mysteries, suspense novels, horror and fantasy for Scholastic. And Scholastic required a, an outline and a first chapter. Okay. And when you're a beginning writer, it is impossible to do an outline of a book you haven't even thought about yet. Um, but they required it because for example, I wrote in a series called The Cheerleaders. I wrote books one, three, five, eight, and 30. And you have to have this outline because you can't do in book eight what you or, was already done in book five or they're planning for book 12. Okay. So they have to know this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's tremendous discipline. I, I really don't recommend it. It's very hard. It is work to do it that way. It's much more fun to do what I do now, which is just to fling myself at it. I find that I have to have a name. I'm going to live with this person and the name has to work. Um, one reason perhaps there are some unusual names, I think Clementine is an unusual name, is that I have an actual shoebox full of index cards with the first names of every character I've ever used. Oh. Well, after all these books, it's a pretty <laughs> stuck box. A lot of people. <laughs> it's a pretty stuck box. And so I have to be sure I'm not using, like if I used the word name Janie, that would be a very poor choice because yeah. I have five books out there with a character named Janie. Once I've named her, she begins to take shape for me. I'm talking to her, I'm thinking about her. And then I just hurl myself at it. I write bits of plot, bits of dialogue, bits of description, just going and going and going. And in this particular book, all the time, my mind is saying, well, why is she doing this? Mm -hmm. and, and trying to figure out, once I decided what it was, how would I make that work? How will I still make this a wonderful person given one of the things that has happened in her past? So um, I don't, I'm not as planned as I was, but that was really good training. Got it. Got it. Um, great. The, the next question kind of dovetails off the last one. This is from the Tamarack District Library. And they'd like to know if your writing process felt easier or harder during this year of COVID-19 pandemic and why? Well, everything is harder this year. Yeah. Um, writing by nature is isolated, but in Sun City, see, you could run out afterwards and play cards or mahjong or go to pottery mm -hmm. or swim in the pool or whatever you were doing. No, you can't do that now. So um, I think we've all learned for the first time what solid, why solitary confinement is a punishment. It is horrible to be alone. In our case, I don't know about your communities, the libraries and bookstores were all closed. Mm -hmm. Life without a library is just inconceivable. I, it's been horrible. One of our libraries, fortunately I can use libraries in two counties and one of them has now opened. So of course I was there the first morning, but to my sadness, um, right behind me was a gentleman who came in carrying a laptop and papers. Well. You could check books out of the library, but they had taken away all the desks and chairs. Mm -hmm. And he was devastated because he said, I do my best work in the library. Well, when is that coming back? Right. So it's, it's been awful to be separated from the joy of libraries. For many of you here, 
Um, the library is a refuge and a pleasure at all times. Um, and it hasn't been there. So are, they're partially back, but libraries do so much more than lend books. And we need libraries back 100%. And of course, we're all praying it will be sooner rather than later. Indeed, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so let's, oh, we've got, let's see. I have one more library question here. This is from the Fulton County Public Library who would like to know, if you had to be a character from one of your books, who would it be and why? I read that question. I thought, I don't, I don't think I can answer that. Is that like asking who your favorite child is? <laughs> when I write a book, I'm living inside it. It's Got so it. crucial to me. I love every bit of it. I talk to those people. I edit them. I revise them. I care about them and their families and their failures and their wardrobes and their futures. But the minute the book is over, it's a closed book. The book is done. At least I pray it is. You probably will have an editor who'll say, no, it isn't done. <laughs> you have to keep working on it, but eventually it's done. And then I'm already on to the next book and, sure. I, and I don't look back. Well, so, I think when you've written so many books too, it's hard. you can't possibly keep all of them in your head. Oh, all the time. Once it's I done, really it has don't. to be done, right? <laughs> One thing that got hard about visiting middle schools and junior highs after many years was kids would say things like, and page 32 of book such and such, <laughs> why did she say? And they're like, I don't even remember book such and such, never mind. <laughs> I could just see that too, because kids are very like they will they'll they'll stick on that kind of thing, won't they? No, they totally will. <laughs> oh, that's great. So it is time before we get to the audience Q and A. It's time for another trivia question. So this one, it's going to pop up on your screen in a moment, and this is not about the book actually. It's about Caroline herself. So. Let's see here. There it is right there. What does Caroline have a collection of? So go ahead and read that through and then make your guesses. And while you're answering that, um, I actually bet we, we can still chat while they're reading and answering okay. that. So um, I bet people would really love to know what you're reading about right now. Do you have a, a book on your nightstand right now? Is there something that you'd like to tell us you're into or or if, if you don't have a particular one to talk about I, I think I saw come up in the audience Q&A people want to know um, what kind of books do you like to read yourself do you like mysteries no. do you like to do something I love else? mysteries, about I read mysteries by the armload but okay. what I'm reading is just crazy I I'm sure many of you do this too you just go on a kick on something one of the um readers of my Facebook author page suggested that I should read a book called Tiger by an author named Valant and this was about the men who study, stalk, are killed by or hunt Siberian tigers. It, it was unlike anything I'd ever read. And the Siberian geography and history were so shocking and so different that I, I was riveted and I immediately Googled, you know, books set in Siberia. And I thought maybe there'd be two, but <laughs> there are a ton. And there, a brand new book came out. I'm trying to think of something about owls. And in this one, a young American uh, researcher has gone to Siberia to research a very rare ice owl. And what this young man goes through in swamps and, you know, horrifying wildernesses and terrifying temperatures and ice that breaks up and he falls through and all this. And you're just stunned that anyone cares that much about anything, let alone owls. But by the <laughs> end of the book, you want the owl too. Oh. So I'm reading all these books about Siberia. It turns out there are mysteries set in Siberia and terrifying adventure stories where people escape Siberia and stuff. So that's my current kick. And you know, you can get this online, but I please libraries open up so I can go to the Siberia section. <laughs> <laughs> leaf through the books. You can get more of your Siberia books. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, how fun. All right. Let's see. Are we ready to reveal the answers to the poll yet? It feels like uh, everyone should have had time. Oh, there we go. We've got the poll results. So other than being a prolific writer, what else does Caroline do? She's a collector of coffee mugs, classic mysteries, bookmarks, or antiques. It is bookmarks. 
I love bookmarks and I sang in a concert choir. And when I was moving to South Carolina, I said, you can't give me anything. I have no space. So everyone gave me a bookmark and I I have a lot of them. But my favorite is from RJ Julia Bookstores, booksellers in Madison, Connecticut. Probably can't read that. It says, be careful. The next page may be odd. (laughs) I love that. I'm very easily entertained, as you can see. Cute. Um. Very cute. (laughs) Thank you for showing us some of your bookmarks. (laughs) All right. So we have, oh, probably a good 20 minutes or so left for some audience questions. So yay. I am going to scroll through these here. We'll get to as many as we can. And I have noticed there are some uh, that are similar. So I'll try and combine a couple too. So please don't be worried if I haven't gotten to your particular one, we'll get something close to an answer. But here's the first one that I want to ask because I, as soon as this question popped up, I had to not giggle out loud because I kind of want to know this too. So Uh um, Francie asks, how did you learn so much about the glass pipe and the marijuana oil? (laughs) My son, he <laughs> the glass pipes. I, I, said, I said to him, so what would a person like you say in a situation like this? And he uttered a sentence and I said, can we clean that up a little bit, please? Nice, nice. <laughs> so I went to his studio, I went to several studios and, um, and my son gave me a ton of help with it because what would I know? I'm really, I'm basically Miss Pris. <laughs> why my son didn't turn out that way is a big question. For many years, I prayed to the Lord to make my son middle class. Oh, that's but, great. But no, okay. <laughs> I got a big kick out of that. I was like, hmm, she certainly knows an awful lot about this uh, drug paraphernalia here. Let's see, what kind of research did Caroline do? That's <laughs> Very cool, very cool. I also have to say, I wish, I almost wish that like in the front, flap there would have been like a sketch of what the dragon glass looked like because I kind of had in my head sort of oh you know what is that what how well so I think the um the 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 cover that you saw had a title which they have now oh that's before she was Helen yes um but the cover of the Freddie book okay glass um it had a different title so they're coming up with a new title for the grandmother plot and, and basically, this is a book about love, by the way. If you love your grandma, and people do, no matter what you've done wrong, and no matter how you've, you've damaged this situation and jeopardized this person, you love your grandmother. Yeah. You have got to get her out of it, no matter what the cost is to you. Indeed, indeed. All right, so very cool. Let's go through uh, some more of these these questions here. So we've got someone, uh, Pam asks, how long did you want to write adult mysteries before you finally leapt into it? Was it something you've kind of always wanted to do or was it a recent decision? I I started with adult mysteries. So it's actually been 40 years. You're you're coming back (laughs) full circle. I published an adult mystery. And um, what happened was uh, this mystery was called Rearview Mirror. Random House published it. It was also a TV movie with Lee Remick. But I had published a short story in Seventeen magazine. Um, it's primarily a fashion magazine, but it used to have a short story every month. Mm-hmm. And a, a scholastic editor read it and called me up and said, would you turn this into a teen paperback romance? And it was so much fun. I didn't go back to adult mysteries. I stayed with YA, but that, that is how I started. Got it. So this is kind of a homecoming for yeah. you. So that also, I think, am I scrolling through here? I think I saw someone ask similarly, are you going to stick now with adult or do you think you will go back to do any more YA or is that- I'm gonna stick with adult. All right, so we're sticking with adult from now on, got it. All right, let's see here. Another question we've got, um, someone asking, let's see here. Oh, you know, well, this, I I don't want to give any spoilers away. We do have some questions coming through um, that ask specific plot points that I think I'll leave those alone for now. Wait, wait, someone says hi. This is Bina Williams, who actually worked at RJ Julius for that book. Oh, how fun. (laughs) Hi, Bina. (laughs) 
Let's see here. Oh, is there going to be a second Clemmy book? Have we seen the last of Clemmy? Is she wrapped up or do you still have her kicking around in your head for a little bit there? I've written another one. We'll see what happens. Um, okay. um, so I'd be so excited if we could bring out a second Clemmy book and a third and a 10th and a 20th. Nice. Never nice. That's great. So we'll see. So kind of uh, piggybacking off of that one, I've got uh, Donna here asking, she says, it's fascinating to hear you talk about the mind of Helen and Clemmy. So do you, do you talk back to your characters as you're writing them? She'd like to know how you develop those characters so realistically. I know you told us that you read your dialogue out loud, which I think is great because there are often times when I'm reading a book if a passage really strikes me as interesting, especially dialogue, I'll, I'll read it out loud to myself because it's kind mm -hmm. of fun to sort of hear that. So is that something you do while you're writing? Do you have conversations with your characters and, and, and let them live in your head for a while? I wouldn't say that I have the conversation, but I, they have conversations with other characters and I, and I do Got that. It. Got and they it. certainly live in my head all the time. And I'm constantly revising their sentences and, and every bit of it. Yeah. Very good, very good. Uh, let's see here. Um, so you talked a little bit about how the book has flashbacks. So we've got Lynn asking, how were you able to make the transitions between flashbacks and the present? Did you find it difficult? Do you have a process for writing flashbacks? Tell us a little bit about that. I, I, you know, I find it difficult to describe process, I think partly because I do so much editing and revising as I go. Mm -hmm. So I'll change any paragraph over and over and over again, just in one day. Um, I like to write, I don't mind revising, I, I never leave anything as it stands. And so the process, I, I guess, is sort of muddy because I'm constantly doing it and, and redoing. Tell me her question exactly again. Um, she wanted to know, how were you able to make transitions between flashbacks oh, and the present? That's very, that is very hard yeah. because um, you have to get the chronology right. For mm -hmm. those of you who read The Face on the Milk Curtain, the one we referred to at the beginning, um, that is packed with flashbacks. And it was probably the first book I did that was like that. And that editor um, constantly had me working on the chronology. It's very hard. You can't give the character something you haven't also given to the reader. And, and you have to work this stuff out. So a lot of the flashbacks for Clemmy were, were too lengthy and had to be divided and, and cut and moved. Um, one thing that I wanted to do in this book was show how different the emotions of women and younger women were in the 50s, uh, about 100 topics. Mm -hmm. And so constantly, Clemmy is referring, or the flashback is referring, to how things were back when she grew up. And yeah. when my daughter was reading this, she said, Ma, cut some of this. We've got the point. It was different then. So I trusted her. And, mm -hmm. and I probably cut 20 references to the olden days, but I kept some of them. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that also gives us an insight into Helen Clemmy being in the present, but her past is always with her. Like I, th right. I find, you know, and especially when people kind of say stuff like that, like, oh, well, you know, back in my day or, you know, things were different then, it really sort of shows you who they were then and who they are now and how that affects them. And this this actually goes nicely into another question I've got here that I, I don't think is giving too much away. Um, this here is from Savannah who says she loved the book so much and her question is a little more serious. She's curious about the um, assault that Clemmy endured in her past alongside the recent Me Too movement, for example. Um, paralleling those two events. It, stri it struck me, she says, that we haven't gotten very far actually in women feeling empowered to step forward and seek help and have the courage to be public about all of it. Did you consider this as you wrote about Clemmy's Helen's situation? So were, were, were well, recent uh, events on your mind? Were you thinking, you know, this Clemmy is- Clemmy was really completed okay. prior to the um, very intense publicity that this has had. So. So it didn't um, directly result in that, but um, I, you know, I don't really know. I don't have any direct experience with it. It's mm -hmm. strictly fictional, but I, I, my assumption is it would be agony to talk about it at any time. Mm -hmm. And 
so it it would it would have nothing to do with what decade you were in mm -hmm. it would be that that your heart is and soul and body are damaged and it and like an animal you're going to hide you're going to try to withdraw from that i think it would be extraordinary if you could just rush out and and discuss it so i think clemmy is probably representative of people now too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well that's great thanks for that insight into that um, let's see, next question here. We've got, uh, Francie is asking, do you ever start an idea for a story, but then have to put it aside because it doesn't work? Do you ever get stage fright? Daily, starting daily, a book? Francie. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we could have had 75 um, more books from Caroline, actually. Um, yeah, you, one reason it is worthwhile to write a first chapter and outline is lots of time the idea you have is only worth a paragraph or not even a good short story. Mm -hmm. You have to be make, make sure that you have something substantial. You have to make sure you have something you wanna live with for quite a long period of time. And you have to make sure you have something that other people are gonna to wanna to read. And um, it, it, I, have, I have tons of ideas. I always have ideas. People say, where do they come from? I don't know, I just have them, they float around. But most of them aren't very valuable. You, you have to pick out the ones that will actually go somewhere. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very, very good advice there, right? Um, so I've got another question here. So your friend Bina actually would like to know, so now that you've moved over into writing adult stories, will you ever write about Janie as an adult? Will you go back to any of your old characters to revisit them? Tell us a little bit about that. Wow, I, I never thought about that. Um, that ended up being just sort of by accident, a five book series. Mm -hmm. Every few years, either I would think or my editor would think of another sort of episode in this poor child's life. Um, and, and she does reach marriage. And to me, that ended it. The, the, she has managed to get through all this, loving her two families and being a good person. And it hasn't been easy. <laughs> and, uh -huh. and, and I think I've done enough with her. Were I to write about her from an adult point of view, my one editor suggested once that I should write about the two mothers. For those of you who haven't mm -hmm. read this book, um, there is the biological mother and the so-called kidnap mother. And they're both very fine women who did the best they could. Um, I, I, I just, I sort of went there. I, I don't see how I could write that again, even mm -hmm. though that would be a very different book. Got it, got it. So speaking more about writing, um, we've got Debbie asking if there are, if there's particular research that you have to do for your books, or is it sort of, do you just kind of write what you know and then fill in spots that might need it? Or are you a researcher when it comes to writing your books? Tell us a little bit about that. I know the librarians in our midst always want to know that. <laughs> That's always the question well, that comes up, yeah. I love research. Um, some books need a lot of it, some don't. Back uh, when I was writing what I'll call sort of entry-level horror for Scholastic, they were no blood, no gore, no bad parents, nothing like that, just for kids who wanted to be a little bit scared. Um, obviously, there was no research involved because with horror, you, you're just making everything up. Mm -hmm. um, some other books have required a lot of research. I did one called Code Orange. And in this, that it was a YA book, the teenage boy stumbles in an old medical text upon a very old envelope, which is sealed, marked smallpox scabs. Now, are these scabs viable? Would he, upon opening this, actually reintroduce the virus to America? And, and that was based on a real incident at a library, I think might have been in New Mexico, where a librarian did um, uh, stumble upon such a thing. And uh, the CDC came to pick up this envelope. And they said to her, she said to them, could it really still be viable after a century? And they said, oh, maybe a chance in a million. Well, that's a chance. A chance in a million. So I did a tremendous amount of research on smallpox, on how smallpox was dealt with in New York City. And because it was set in Manhattan, I got to walk every block, take every 
um, form of transportation and stuff. It was a ton of fun to write, loads of research. Now, Clemmy, um, I did do a lot of research on how to vanish, but none of it turned out really to be appropriate because she vanishes prior to the internet, prior to lots of um, tracking methods that we have now. And so for her, it just didn't have the problems that you would have if you wanted to vanish today. Although, as I said, just come to Sun City, you'll automatically vanish. <laughs> Maybe you can vanish in Siberia as well. <laughs> I know, I bet you could. We do have someone that is curious to see if you're going to write, uh, they'd like to know if you'd like to write historical fiction or maybe one that's set in Siberia, if that's your, your new wow. passion. Well, would you, would you Siberia know? turned out to be so strange, <laughs> so astonishing, so terrifying. First of all, I'd never go there. <laughs> you, you, you need to take a research trip, for example. No, <laughs> it was so scary. Um, but it's worth reading those books about it. No, so that's that's something I could never pull off because it's just so alien. You wait till you read those two books I mentioned. I you, bet. Be I bet up. that's. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple minutes left to answer a couple more of these audience questions. They've been coming in fast and furious here. And um, we, everybody, of course, always wants to know when they get a chance to talk to an author, do you have any kind of writing advice for people who are just starting to hone their craft? And then um, another question that's kind of similar to that is someone asking, um, so you, it sounds like you write every single day. Is that, is that true? So do you have a set schedule? Do you, I know a lot of authors, they've got, okay, I get up, my writing is from nine until five. That's when I stop. They treat it as like an office job. Tell us a little bit about your writing schedule and what, what do you suggest to people who are just starting to write? How do they, how do they really get into it? I'm going to back up to, do I have advice? Okay. I had a wonderful sixth grade teacher. His name was Mr. Albert. And he made us write a short story every week. And what he would do would be pass out uh, actually a New Yorker magazine cover. They were very bright colored cartoony things. And you had to base it on that. And he would set a timer for 15 minutes. And he would say, you can do anything for 15 minutes. Work as hard as you can for 15 minutes. And he was right. You can achieve a whole short story in 15 yes, minutes. Yes, right? Feel right. Like. And I still set a timer. If the task is really awful, I say to myself, I can do anything for 15 minutes. And um, so my first advice to you if you're starting is I know that you, you're you probably already stranded and saying to yourself, I wanna do this, I don't know how to go. So just start, start with anything, a description, a paragraph, dialogue, plotting, anything, but set that timer for 15 minutes and make it like hard exercise because it is, you can do anything for 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. force yourself to write solidly for 15 minutes. And if it's stupid and useless, so what? Everything I write is stupid, stupid and useless. Tomorrow, you're gonna fix it and then it'll be mediocre. And the day after that, you'll work on it again, it'll be average. So you'll just keep going until this 15 minutes is a routine. And then you're gonna do that 15 minutes a dozen times a day when you finally get going, just, just do it. There you go. Did you always know that you wanted to be a writer or did was writing something that just sort of you came, you, you came into it? Tell us, tell us a little bit about um, your early days as a writer. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I really did always want to do it um, because of Mr. Albert. It was just a lot of fun. But I also went to music school and to nursing school. I didn't like quite that much music and nursing People, I'll, I'll tell you a secret. I, since I grew up on Cherry Ames student nurse and Sue Barton student nurse, I was stunned to find that instead of cute interns, there were a lot of sick people. <laughs> so I didn't stick with nursing. And I actually started writing when I was um, maybe 20. And, um, and my first eight books were never published. So those of you who are losing hope, um, most people learn their craft quicker than I did, but don't tell me you wrote one chapter and it was hard. Mm -hmm. um, when you've written eight books and they haven't been published and you get up in the morning and you write a ninth, then, then I'll be impressed. But that's what I did. I just chose not to give up. There you go. All right. Um, we've got a 
about maybe one, two minutes left for another question. So let's see here. Like I said, I don't want to give away too many spoilers. Um, I do I do have actually this question from Mayori, I think was interesting because I, I would wonder this too. And she asks, and I don't think it's giving away too much. So considering Dom's nature, you know, everybody talks about how he's kind of a, a grump and not very pleasant to be around and unkempt and all of that. So what made him give his phone number to Helen to check up on him? Well, if you live alone, you're, mm -hmm. one of your big worries is to have a heart attack. You're lying on the floor. You've seen these TV ads. I fell and I can't. Right. I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> Absolutely true. So what are you going to do? And many people who live alone ask a neighbor to text them or they text um, because somebody has to check on somebody. So he has decided that he trusts her. It probably is a little out of character, but what choice does he have? Mm -hmm. you, you, because you are fearful at that age. Okay, so if we're about to close, my thing is, don't forget, I want yeah. to send these. So send me your name and email address so I can mail you some book plates. That's right. So we're going to have, um, Tiffany is going to put her, her email address up in that chat box again one more time for us because it's also time um, we want to thank everybody for participating by asking your questions and by participating in the trivia so um as soon as she can there trivia oh she's got it right there i see as oh, i'm talking that's it. yeah we've got our trivia winners so congratulations to pam spencer holly helen grieg and bina williams so we've got um those winners there and if you would please email your addresses to Tiffany right there at her her email tiffany.schultz at sortsbooks.com and then anyone else who would like one of those fantastic signed book plates go ahead and email Tiffany and she will get that over to Caroline to send them out to you which is awesome so Caroline thank you so much for spending time with us tonight it's been a wonderful fascinating conversation always fun to learn about you know the the stories behind the stories really so thanks for sharing so much with us thank you Rebecca it's been a pleasure everybody Thank you. And thank you to everyone who has been watching tonight. We really appreciate you being here with us. Make sure that you join us for the next Murder at the Library event, which is going to be Wednesday, December 2nd at 7 o'clock Eastern, where I will be talking with best-selling author Stuart Turton. Stuart is the author of the best-selling Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle, and he's going to be discussing his newest mystery, The Devil and the Dark Water. So that's Wednesday, December 2nd second, same time, same place. Um, we're also going to have, oh, wait, I see it just go through there in the chat. There's a link there to register for that. So that's up there. Register early for it. Thank you again for joining us. I hope everyone stays safe and happy reading, everyone. Thanks again, Caroline. Bye, everybody.